been saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast. All because of what happened at Calvary roughly 2,000 years ago, right? In Matthew 26, we read the story that transpires just before the cross. It's the same night. It's the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane, and he said, Sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. And he told them, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Now, you and I might use that as an expression to say, I'm having a really bad day. In the case of Jesus, this was a very literal description of what was happening. You will recall the very first gospel promise in the book of Genesis chapter 3 was what? That the serpent would bruise his heel, but that Jesus, the Messiah, would crush the head of the serpent. The irony is that to crush the head of the serpent, Jesus himself was the one who would have to be crushed under the judgment of God, right? Under the judgment of the Father. Because it is against God and against the Father that all sin is committed. And so here we see Jesus already beginning to experience what would ultimately be fulfilled on the cross. In fact, it is my firm conviction that the cross itself was not necessary for our salvation. Now, now, don't freak out. Just hold on a second. The cross is merely the instrument of torture. The death of Jesus was happening in Gethsemane. It was here that already in his soul he was feeling the separation that between, between him and the Father. A separation that had never been known in the Godhead, in the triune Godhead. There had never been a separation like this. They had always been one with each other. And now for the first time in all of cosmic history, something new is affecting this Godhead, this triune Godhead. And in the very being of Jesus, there is a fragmentation that's taking place. That's what's happening with Jesus. You've never seen him like you see him here in Gethsemane, anywhere else in the story of Scripture. You've seen him harassed. You've seen him tired. You've seen him worn out. But you've never seen him in a place where in his soul, he's feeling like things are not right between him and his father. He's used to human conflict. He's used to human betrayal. You'll see him often being threatened with, with physical death. They want to throw him off the cliff. They want to get rid of him. They're plotting all the time against him. But you've never seen him not at peace, except here in Gethsemane. Because in Gethsemane, the weight of our sin is coming down upon him. But Jesus was not to die in Gethsemane. He was to go to the cross, not because the cross itself was central to salvation, not because the cross was the means of a death, but in the time in which he lived, the cross was the most public form of shame. The cross was the place where it was undeniable in the public eye that someone was dying. And so for the sake of the gospel story, for the sake of, you know, what happened when Jesus was, was uh, buried in the tomb, right? And there was a resurrection and it was a very private affair and it was only a few who saw it. There was a conspiracy theory that was begun there. The beginning of conspiracy theories. The conspiracy theory was that the disciples had come and taken the body and hidden it and, and, and that they were spinning the story. It was a public relations exercise, spin, spinning the story that Jesus was alive again. The death of Jesus was not to be something that would happen privately in a garden with only the 12 who were the inner circle to see it. It needed to happen publicly so that no one could deny it had happened. In that sense, it needed to happen at the cross. But the nature of the death was not the instrument of torture. The nature of the death was not the physical suffering. It wasn't the 40 lashings that he received. It wasn't the, the, the fact that he was dehydrated on the cross. It wasn't any of the physical stuff that added to the trial of the ordeal. What was happening in Gethsemane was the nature of the death. The Father's presence was beginning to treat Jesus like he should have treated the sinner. Jesus was becoming our substitute in death. It was in Gethsemane that Jesus was now being frowned upon by the Father, for the lack of a better metaphor. It was here that the Father was saying to Jesus, I am no longer pleased with you. Remember his baptism? This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. 
but no longer. Because Jesus is humanity's substitute in the Garden of Gethsemane. You are no longer the son in whom I am well pleased. You are the son that will bear the wrath of God for the world. My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went a little farther, bowed his face to the ground, praying, My father, if it's possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I do want your will to be done. He returned to his disciples. He found them asleep. He said to Peter, couldn't you keep watch with me even for one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, yes, but the body is weak. Jesus left them a second time and prayed, my father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. He returned to them again. He found them sleeping for they couldn't keep their eyes open. So, they went, so he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Question for you this morning. Understanding what we're meditating on. What if in that moment of wrestle, Jesus had decided to put his own well-being first? What if in the moment of this wrestling, I mean, this, this is the battle. If Jesus, if Jesus had not won the battle in Gethsemane, the cross would have been meaningless. The cross wouldn't have even happened. He could withdraw from the plan of salvation if he wanted to. Jesus was, not, Jesus was not a hostage. He was a willing participant. He was the volunteer. He took responsibility for his own creation. He took creation into his own being. He came to seek and to save the lost. He was here by his own volition. At any moment in time, he can withdraw and say, no, 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 no. This, I'm not doing this anymore. And here he is wrestling with self-preservation. Versus your preservation. So what if, let's just play this what if game. What if somewhere in these, these three wrestling matches, don't be discouraged if you find yourself having to wrestle with your weakness more than once. Don't be discouraged if you find yourself, you know, bringing your weakness and your struggle to God and you think, yes, 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 I think, I think the peace of God has come over me. I think I've gained a victory. I think, I think, I think I'm okay now. And then tomorrow... Next week, some point in time, the same temptations come back at you. And you think, but we went through this. We, we, we wrestled through this. We gained the victory over this. I thought I'd gained the victory. What is going on here? Don't be surprised because you're only walking in the footsteps of the master. Three times he wrestles. He gains the victory. He comes back. Nah, got to go back again. So what if in the midst of all of that, somewhere, he said, no. No. No, I'm not doing this. I can't do this. I won't do this. What story would we be telling? There wouldn't be a story. There wouldn't be a story about Jesus. And there wouldn't be a story about you. Because if it wasn't for what Jesus did, there would be no human story. It would end. Submission is probably the hardest word to comprehend and experience for the fallen sinful nature. We rebel against submission at every turn. We see it in our children. And when you think you've grown up and you think you no longer struggle with it, just wait until another adult tells you what to do. Right? It's amazing how we resent the idea of submission. But without submission, you would not be saved. Without surrender, if you prefer that word, there would be no salvation. It is because of his perfect submission, because of his perfect surrender in the midst of the struggle that we have a story, that we have a hope, that we have redemption and forgiveness and reconciliation with God. It is because he submitted, because he surrendered, and he calls you and I to the same. It is the quintessential struggle of the human race to surrender, to obey. You are not saved by your obedience. You are saved by his obedience. You are not saved through your personal surrender. You're saved through his surrender and your surrender to that surrender. <laughs> Does that make any sense? You see, 
When you look yourself in the mirror, when you have those moments of introspection, when you examine the struggle of your soul, you will realize that it always comes down to the Garden of Gethsemane. Your Gethsemane. Your Gethsemane may be in your study at home or at your bedside or, or at some other place physically, but it's always the struggle of Gethsemane. Gethsemane is the struggle of submission. It is the struggle of surrender. It is the struggle between my will versus his will, my, the preservation of my little world and my life as I see it versus surrender to his plan and, 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 and his cause. Gethsemane follows us to this day. Wherever you go, wherever you find yourself, the human nature struggles against giving up, against surrendering and submitting to the will of God. But without that, there is no story, no salvation. It is the hardest victory to gain because in the world's mindset and in our carnal nature, there's something instinctive that says to surrender and to submit is weakness. Well, if it's weakness, then it should be the easy way. But it's the hardest struggle of your life. So maybe, I should, maybe we should rightly say that surrender and submission is in actual fact the height of our strength. Change the narrative. Tell a new story to yourself. If it were the easy way, if it were weakness, it would be the easy way. But it's not. To surrender and to submit to God, to, to deny myself and to give over to his plan is the hardest struggle of, of this life, which makes you at that point where you do that, the strongest you will ever be. Because at that place, you have all of the power of divinity at your disposal. As long as you wrestle against it, you stand in your own strength. But when you finally submit to it, you are empowered. It's the weirdest thing. It's the strangest thing. It's counterintuitive, but it is the story of the gospel. It is the story of Christ's victory, and it is the story of your victory. And it is why we eat the bread, and it is why we drink the grape juice, because... We demonstrate, we participate in. It is like an altar call, but instead of coming forward, we, we physically partake of these emblems saying that we will take his body and we will take his blood, spiritually speaking, and his submission will be our submission and his victory will be our victory and his strength will be our strength. We will eat and we will drink at his table. We will kneel in the Garden of Gethsemane with him. We will wrestle and we will submit and we will surrender. A lady by the name of Rachel Balducci tells a story of when she was learning to drive at the tender age of 15. She was a, one of eight children, and so they never had a small car. They always had a big car, a bigger than a seven-seater car. In fact, she learned to drive in one of those 15-seater passenger vans. Can you imagine learning to drive in one of those things? She tells a story one day, her brother's in the back and her father's sitting next to her and she's driving the two of them home in this big van. They're coming down this big hill. And at the, at, near the bottom of the hill, near their house, they have right of way to keep going and there is a stop sign for, for the intersecting traffic. And as she's driving down this road, knowing that she has right of way, suddenly her father says to her, stop the van now, stop! And without hesitating and without thinking, she Slammed her foot on the brake. She hadn't seen anything. She knew she had right of way. But her father said to her, stop and stop now. And so not knowing why and not understanding and not questioning, she put her foot on the brake and she stopped just in time for someone to fly through the intersector, inter intersection that should have stopped and would have plowed right into the side, side of them. She tells the story in her blog. She says, what if I had stopped to question my father? What if I had stopped to argue with him that I have right of way? Dad, there's no stop street here. I can go. What if just for a second or two, because that's all the time they had, she just hesitated, trying to make sense of what her father was saying? The story might have ended there. Fast forward a few years, she has her own children. She's walking with them 
in, in town one day and she's pushing the youngest in a stroller and the little, little guy, Olgi is his name, and as Olgi is walking along, he gets ahead of them and he's starting to go towards the crossing of the, of the street over there and she sees the same thing her father saw from a distance. She sees cars coming and so she, she can't leave the stroller because it's got a baby in it and Olgi is too far ahead and so all she can do is what? Yell. Olgi, Stop! Because he was going to run. And in that moment, he stopped. And the car came by. Twice in her lifetime, once with her being the child, once with her being the parent, she tells the story of obedience. A story which had everything riding on it. How she responded to her father, how her son responded to her in that moment made the difference between life and death. I think the lesson is apparent. We don't always understand why God calls to us in the way that he does. We don't always understand why God leads us in the way that he does. We don't always understand the wherefores, the whys, the hows. We sometimes just hear his voice, whether it's through scripture, whether it's the impression of the spirit, whether it's the counsel of others. Sometimes that voice goes diametrically, uh, you know, cuts diametrically across everything we want or everything we think is logical or everything we think that is our right. And we think to ourselves, should I obey that voice? Could that really be the voice of God? God, why would he be telling me this? In that moment, the choice is, will I trust the goodness of my father or not? You see, you don't need to know the answer to every question. You don't even need to understand why God has said what he said. You need to know his character. You need to know whether he's good and whether he's trustworthy. If you know that, you can obey even when you don't understand. If you know that he's always got your back, that his character is always love, that you can always trust him, then you know that you can say yes to him when it doesn't make sense. And you can trust him in the darkness. You see, it's less about knowing the answer to everything and more about knowing the one who is your father. Jesus, in his humanity, wrestled with his own will, the desire to live, to survive, to go on. And the calling of his father to lay it all down, to give it all up, to be the sacrifice. And he chose to listen to the voice and the call of his father. As we eat the bread in a little while and as we drink the wine, I wonder... Will you listen to his voice? Let me pray with you. Father in heaven, today as we wash one another's feet to start with, as we celebrate that ritual of cleansing that is the symbol of our humiliation, our willingness to serve, to walk in your footsteps, to recognize that the point of our greatness is actually the point of our lowness, the point of our strength, is actually the place of our submission. As we celebrate this upside-down kingdom, we pray that today your spirit will again refresh us and touch us and remind us, speak to us and call us, for we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Gentlemen, as always, we're going to head down to the hall at the far end. Ladies, you're going to head down to the conference room just before the hall. If any of you are with us who haven't celebrated communion before, please know that you are welcome to join us. If you prefer to observe, you're welcome to do that too. We'll separate now. God bless.